For millennia, our knowledge of the peoples of ancient Canaan was almost exclusively informed by the myth history of the Hebrew Bible, the Christian Old Testament. However, when a farmer's plow struck into an ancient Bronze Age tomb in 1928, the lost city of Ugarit began to revolutionize our understanding of that region and its ancient peoples. Thousands of cuneiform tablets written in the alphabetic Ugaritic language detailed the terminal days of this late Bronze Age civilization, destroyed like so many others around 1200 BCE. Here, the mythical landscape once familiar from the Hebrew Bible is turned upside down. El is not synonymous with Yahweh. In fact, Yahweh may have not even made it to Canaan yet. Baal is a storm deity worthy of adulation, having defeated sea and death, making way for the land's fertility. A cadre of fierce divine women, including the warrior goddess Anat, populate the divine family and the divine council. And the Rephaim aren't straw man giants for the Israelites to defeat, but the honored kingly dead. In this way, I would say that our understanding of the Canaanites is finally stood on its feet compared to the anti-Canaanite propaganda of the Hebrew Bible. Outside of the contours of religious myth, we also learn a bit more about the indigenous magical and divinatory practices of that region, and that's what I want to turn to in this episode. Let's explore what we can, what remains of the magical technologies of the late Bronze Age Canaanites. Make sure to subscribe to the channel, check out my other content, including numerous curated playlists, and consider supporting this work of making scholarly and free content on topics and esotericism free here on YouTube by checking out my Patreon with a one-time donation, or you can check out the super thanks in the links below. Your support really makes this channel possible, and I really, really appreciate it. But now... Let's turn to the magic of the Canaanites of ancient Ugarit, right on the eve of the Bronze Age collapse. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. As I mentioned in the introduction for millennia, our knowledge of the ancient peoples of Canaan was profoundly informed, really, let's be honest, distorted by the writers of those specific Canaanites known as the Israelites. Of course, the Israelites did exist in the region. The Egyptian pharaoh Merneptah mentions, well, slaughtering most of them, some of them at least, around 1208 BCE right around the time that the doom came to Ugarit as part of the larger systems collapse that we call the Bronze Age Collapse. However, since the 1920s, excavations at Ras Shamra, or ancient Ugarit, have revolutionized our understanding of the region, especially in the domains of Canaanite religion and myth. Though, of course, the tablets from Ugarit only represent what was present in the final death throes of that city, with the fires of its destruction preserving in, like, freeze frame the cuneiform records of the city, and even then, only really the religious rituals and perspectives of a tiny minority of the priest and political elites of this specific city. So we should be careful to extrapolate too much from the remains of Ugarit. And this is certainly a case of the survival bias if there ever was one, but we have to deal with what actually remains while acknowledging how narrowly this likely captures Canaanite myth, religion, magic, etc. as just one example, but it's the one we have. Also, I'll say before getting into the specific magical and divinatory texts in this episode that if you want an accessible and inexpensive, can you believe that? I said inexpensive reader of the Ugaritic mythology, that we'll be talking about in this episode, I'd really highly recommend the text Stories from Ancient Canaan by Coogan and Smith. This text was prepared for a more popular audience, that's why it's not so expensive, and contains pretty helpful introductions and notes. 
This text is especially interesting for anyone interested in doing comparative work with the ancient Israelites and their forebears, one can say, are just the greater religious mythology of the ancient Near East. But make sure to check out that text if you're interested in Canaanite mythology more generally. Of the ritual, magical, and divinatory material found at Ugera, we might draw a line between those texts which are clearly cultural importations, especially those from Mesopotamian culture and those written primarily in Akkadian. In fact, these texts actually represent the majority of such religious texts found at Ugarit, reflecting the deep influence of those cultures on the Canaanites. Of the 70 or so Babylonian religious texts found at Ugarit, about a dozen of those are incantational or magical texts, way more than what we actually have in Ugaritic. While the Babylonian texts are interesting, they fall very much inside of what we see in similar collections found actually already in situ over in Mesopotamia. Thus, in this episode, I'll be focusing on those texts written specifically in the Ugaritic language, kind of an archaic cousin of Hebrew, and likely more reflective of the indigenous practices of the Bronze Age Western Levant. Though the Ugaritic texts do fit well within the structural framework found more generally in the ancient Near East between the evil sorcerer, the Kashapu Kashaptu, and the magician exorcist physician, the Mashmashu or the Ashipu, this dialectic is more broadly found in the ancient Near East. Now, if you want to learn more about that combat between evil sorcerers and good exorcists, you can check out my episode on the Maklu ritual in which Sumerian and Babylonian gods were summoned and evoked through an overnight ritual to do combat against malevolent sorcery, which is just one of the most interesting rituals of all time, and kind of the background to the Simon Necronomicon of all things. So yeah, check out my episode on the Mockley ritual if you're interested in magical combat in the ancient Near East. Of course, divination was widely practiced in the ancient Near East. It's practiced in basically every culture because everybody wants to know the future. And specific examples of divinatory practices have survived from ancient Ugarit. The most widely attested divinatory practice appears to have been consultations for specific individuals based on the inspection of the livers and lungs of various sacrificed animals. The inscriptions are often very short, usually naming the concerned party, such as, quote, this is the litter of model of YPT, son of YKN, we're not sure about the vocalization, when this month was about to begin. That's it. The models themselves are specifically marked such that a ritual expert could read the model in the divinatory consultation. Sadly, none of the manuals to decipher the markings on the liver models survive. If they were ever written down to begin with, it's very likely or just as likely this was a completely oral tradition. Though, such manuals are widespread in the Babylonian context. You can read numerous examples of liver reading model books. Another lung model is much more manual-like, and this model seems to have actually indicate both divinatory outcomes, such as an attack on a city, and various sacrifices that may actually ward off such a fate. Interestingly enough, other siege omens are also known from other liver tablets, especially those at the city of Mari. The city of Mari seems to have been particularly interested in liver divination. Again, these texts have a kind of quasi-scientific flavor, describing a clear mechanical connection between the sign, its ominous character, and the means by which one can elude that fate. In this way, the formulated character of these texts may well speak to both their antiquity, they had really worked this out over a long period of experimentation perhaps, but also long-standing cultural reliance on this mode of divination in the Western Levant. Of course, this mode of telling the future via liver inspection would be common in the Roman period and in many subsequent periods to come. You'd also be unsurprised to learn that astrology played a significant role in ancient Near East divinatory practices, but you might be surprised to learn that only a handful of such texts have actually survived from Ugarit. Previously thought to detail a solar eclipse, a more recent reading actually understands a astrological text as detailing the appearance of Rashap, or Rashaf, probably Mars, in the night sky before setting a few days after the new moon. The reverse of the text is somewhat damaged, but it may actually say that this omen could prompt further permissions from the governor to do 
probably more liver inspections, or that this setting of Mars after the new moon may be a sign of a good omen for seeking specific political intervention with the governor of Ugarit. It's not quite clear. Another astrologically related text is a sequentially arranged, quote, if then, if this happens, then this will happen, analysis of the condition as the moon rises. Especially of interest is the apparent color of the moon over the course of any given lunar month. Again, we're dealing with a damaged text like many of them, but we learned that, for instance, a red rising moon means prosperity that month, apparently toward the beginning of the month, and that a yellow-green moon indicates that, I guess, cattle will perish. Again, what we have here is this if-then mechanical logic of previous forms of divination already mentioned. These texts have a kind of scientific character at some level indicating that this culture believed that these issues of fate were at some level perhaps mechanically determined, though could be intervened by the use of certain sacrifices such that perhaps the gods could reverse that fate. Another genre of divination was concerned with the ominous appearance of malformed fetuses, both animal and human, and also takes this if-then formulation. These manuals detail various outcomes based on fetal malformation, also known as teratomancy, literally telling the future from the birth of monsters, it's monstermancy. Thus, a missing right ear from an animal will mean an invasion, but a missing left ear will mean that the king of Ugarit will devastate the land of his enemies. A cyclopean birth, that is to say a birth with the eye in the center of the forehead, will mean that the king will outmatch a specific group of troops, and so on. A similar text also extant deals with human fetuses and also takes the if-then formulation, though the text is so badly damaged that not much can be gleaned from it, unfortunately, especially the nature of the fetal malformations and the then part of the text. Again, all of these are quasi-bureaucratic in scope, reflecting the outcomes of this form of divination for the city as a whole or the military position of the king. Now, to what degree this form of divination was also practiced by common people isn't clear. Also, such a text also appear in the Shuma Izbu series. This is a series of Babylonian divination that deals with malformed fetuses as well. So again, we probably have some degree of cultural exchange. Though, it's worth noting that all of the texts that I'm mentioning in this episode are surprisingly free of Akkadian interpolation. That's the language of Old Babylon even of technical terms used in the divinatory practices of ancient Babylon. The Ugaritic writers are very likely expressing their own practices from their own traditions in their own language, along with making use of Babylonian magical and divinatory practices where those made sense. I mean, magic is nothing if not syncretistic. A final divinatory text from Ugarit details the relationship of omens found in dreams in relationship to specific sacrificial practices. It appears that specific events in dreams, whose dreams isn't clear, but I strongly suspect this is the dream of a high-ranking priest like the Ta'iyu priest or perhaps the king, but these will require a specific sacrifice in order to ward off an impending event or otherwise ensure that such an event would go in such and such a manner. Again, the text is fragmentary, but details a wide range of sacrificial options based on what a person might see in a dream, including horses and donkeys, which are not part of the later Israelite sacrificial system. Just worth noting there. And this gives, again, a vague sense of the kinds of dream events that would have prompted such sacrifices. Thus, you would have a dream, see something in the dream, and then if you didn't do something, then a certain kind of thing would happen. But if you didn't want that to happen, you could do a certain set of sacrifices. And it seems like that perhaps would derail fate or change one's fate based on the kind of sacrifice involved. All right, let's transition to some of the magical texts. Of course, the line between magic and religion is more or less impossible to demarcate, and I'm, I'm not going to try. Though, what we have in the following texts are specifically non-sacrificial cultic rituals marked by poetic repetition and causal outcomes. That poetic repetition, it's incantation-like. Again, something not unlike magic as we might understand it ourselves. Again, telling us more about what we think about magic than what the ancient people of Ugarit thought about what they were doing. Unlike ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, such texts are actually pretty poorly attested in ancient Ugarit, but not 
totally absent. Those that survive seem specifically to deal with snakes, snake and scorpion bites, male sexual dysfunction, and the repulsion of the evil eye. This is actually a pretty normal distribution of things you would find in a general assortment of ancient magic. The incantation against snakes and snakes and scorpion bites is one of the best attested incantations from Ugarit. It's remarkably in good shape. It specifically uses a type of sacred wood against both snakes and scorpions, but also against the tormentors and sorcerers that employ such creatures to harm others. It's twofold. You get rid of the poisonous creatures and you get rid of the toxic people. In fact, this incantation was prepared for a certain Utenu whose name survives at the end of the text. The elimination of snakes is also the subject of one of the most elaborate such texts to have survived from ancient Ugarit. Here we have a series of incantations uttered by a cosmic mare, yeah, a female horse, made to the various gods in various regions through the ancient Levant. Encountering 12 such gods along the way, this cosmic mare finally meets Khoranu, the Ugaritic god of magic, capable of gathering up all the snakes and their venom from the lands. Here, Khoranu proposes to the divine mare, and together they go riding through the land, ridding it of various poisonous snakes, lizards, and scorpions. In the second text, which is far less well preserved, there is an apparent snake-bitten victim, a, perhaps another cosmic horse, perhaps, for whom the gods are appealed to to help with little success. Interestingly, in this and other texts, El, the chief god of the Ugaritic pantheon, like El, who eventually gets merged with Yahweh, is helpless, helpless with the poisonous bite and with other forms of illness, such as before in the Kirta epic. There, the almighty god El, the chief of the pantheon, is powerless against illness and actually creates Khoranu as a kind of golem god, they're really made out of clay, as a specific wielder of magical or ritual power to defeat the illness via magic that had befallen Kirta. Thus, such incantorial power in the Ugaritic mind was, at least to some degree, detached from the larger El Baal cult, with Khoranu being specifically empowered with specific incantational duties and powers. Of course, Israelite literature abounds in tales of snakes from the serpent in the Garden of Eden to the bronze snake Moses used to heal those snake-bitten. There's even a prohibition on an otherwise poorly understood and basically unknown form of magic or divination found at Deuteronomy 18 that a person there referred to as a menachesh, something like snake-doer person. This perhaps means something like one who hisses like a snake or whispers an incantation. In fact, as late as the rabbinical literature, one of the more astounding miracles mentioned in the Talmud during the Second Temple period was that no one was bitten by a snake, and there is a cure in the Talmud for snake bites that requires a kind of compress made from the fetus of a white donkey. If you're wondering why the fetus of a white donkey, there's a pun in Aramaic between snake, chivya, and white, chivra, with the like cures like logic rather apparent here. That like cures like logic is going to reappear in just a moment, actually. Another incantation detailing a general formula for dealing with male sexual dysfunction, perhaps either sexual disease or impotence or both. Again, this text targets both the specific harm, but also the sorcerers that have inflicted it. Specifically in this text, Khoranu, the god of magic, is invoked in this incantation. A spell against the evil eye is perhaps one of the most evocative, with the concept of the evil eye, quote, devouring one's flesh without a knife, to drink one's blood without a cup. Here again, the power of the evil eye is rebuked and returned to its origin. It's even possible that this text contains some guesses by the person who had it commissioned as to how who would curse the person in question. We have mentioned the BTY person, we're not sure the vocalization, the price setter person, the assembler, and the gatekeeper as all potential dealers out of the curse who are targeted such that the evil eye will return to them. Regardless, an interesting form of counter magic against the evil eye. In another incantational mythological text, the god Dinatu, often associated with divine healing, is also consulted for an ill child, perhaps again we have another snake bite here, or another illness simply known as mar, or bitterness. 
Here, myrrh is placed in a bottle in the temple of the magic god Huranu. That bottle is then moved to the house or temple of Baal, and then something called BNT, again, we don't know the vocalization, is taken to the child's house such that it will reveal the specific illness. Finally, we're told that Dintanu urges the house to be swept clean and that fish and dog should be removed from the premises such that the mar, our bitterness, will finally disappear. Ritual cleaning, by the way, is ubiquitous in many magical traditions of the ancient Near East and beyond those borders also. Finally, we have what is one of my favorite tales from the Ugaritic myth cycles. Here we find the fatherly god El at his Marzeach, or ritual sacrifice slash drinking party. Having drunk wine to drunkenness, El is born along home only to fall in his own urine and feces due to his heavy intoxication. Seeing El in such a shape, some of the gods actually go to fetch him a cure for his impending hangover. The language here is also even reminiscent of trying to bring him back from the dead. And here we have just one of the earliest hangover cures ever recorded in literature. The hairs of a dog, yep, the hairs of a dog are placed on the forehead along with the head and shoots of the PQQ plant. Again, we don't know the vocalization. This is all soaked in olive oil. Literally, the text says the blood of the olives. This hairs of a dog business is probably a reference to that like cures like logic from earlier. There the hairs of a dog are actually used to treat a dog bite and it appears that this logic is sort of a bit detached and then applied literally in the case of a hangover. Just as alcohol caused the hangover to begin with, so too should a bit of alcohol the morning after cure it, just as the hairs of the dog should cure the dog bite. But it's honestly flabbergasting to see such a logic, the literal hairs of a dog, being used from a hangover from a culture now more than 3,000 years ago. One wonders to what degree there's cultural continuity there, or is there just a kind of structural homology where this kind of logic is reinvented over and over and over again in various cultures. Regardless, to see the hairs of a dog used for a hangover cure, it's pretty amazing. Though you can't use just the hairs of a dog, you have to use the PQQ plant, but who knows what the PQQ plant was. At any rate, the discovery of ancient Ugarit has truly allowed us a glimpse into the last days of a Bronze Age Canaanite society. From their sacrificial system to religious mythology to the magical and divinatory technology they employed, we finally have a better grasp on this magnificent culture than the stereotyped view provided by the later myth history of the ancient Israelites. Of course, the Israelites being Canaanites themselves, despite the legends they told about themselves, a substantial amount of continuity can be detected between the Amorite culture of Ugarit and the Highlander Israelites down there to the south. From the assimilation of El and Yahweh in their religious literature as monotheism developed, the specific concerns around various venomous snakes and divination and dreams and visions, these texts provide us a truly wonderful glimpse into the world facing the Bronze Age collapse and the doorway into the Iron Age with the rise of ancient Israel and Judah. The two best texts in English for better understanding the ritual, culting, and magical life in ancient Ugarit are Pardee's Ritual and Cult in Ugarit and Gregorio de Oma Leite's masterful incantations and anti-witchcraft text from Ugarit. Both of these texts contain extensive treatments of the material discussed here, often with long, careful discussions of every single word of the original Ugaritic text. I mean, they are doing microscopic analysis of these texts. They both can be a little specialized, but are otherwise wonderful additions to anyone wishing to better grasp the world of the Bronze Age Levantine ritual and magic. They're absolutely essential if you want to have a complete collection of really understanding magic in the ancient world. Though, speaking of healing, I am going to go take a rest. If you can't tell, because I'm not my normal chipper, chipper self, it's because I'm actually filming this episode with COVID. So I don't feel super great. I'm going to go take a break, see if I can get Huranu on the line or Ascalapius or somebody. But until next time, 
Thank you for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.